Welcome to Agri-Food Conversations, brought to you by iSelect, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. My name is Hannah Hund. I'm an analyst on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to welcome you all to today's discussion. Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in agriculture. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, including emerging topics such as soil health, plant genetics, vertical farming, and aquaculture, to name a few. This month's theme is hemp, and on today's call, we're joined by Ginger Dewar, founder and CEO of Delta Valley Farm Management. Delta Valley Farm Management has been farming hemp at scale in North America for four years. From its first 100-acre test farm on the western slope of Colorado, it has expanded into Canada and multiple U.S. states. Dewar will discuss the trajectory of the emerging hemp industry thus far, the steep learning curve and realities of scaled hemp cultivation, current pinch points and infrastructure needs, and the likely evolution of hemp farming within each agricultural region of the United States. She will also delve into the international markets where our competition on each major use of hemp lies and what advantages and disadvantages apply to American hemp farmers in a global market. Each of you knows companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We have invited you all to this call because you are some of the smartest, most talented people in Delta Valley Farm Management's market. You are potential customers for Delta Valley Farm Management's products and services. You have built a company similar to Delta Valley Farm Management, or you are a sophisticated business person or agricultural professional who understands the market and the challenges and opportunities Delta Valley Farm Management may face. Before we get started, please have a quick, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a few seconds to answer. Great, a few process comments. We are not soliciting investment. This presentation is to provide information to help Delta Valley Farm Management find REIT customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. You are all on mute. You can use the chat window to ask a question at any time. This presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, I'm pleased to introduce Ginger Dewar, founder and CEO of Delta Valley Farm Management. Ginger? Hi guys, um, I am stuck a little bit here um, on, oh, there we go, forgive me. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Delta Valley Farm Management. Um, we started out on the Western Slope of Colorado back in late 2016. I planted a 100 acre test farm split between eight licenses. Um, separated each of those eight fields into multiple sections, we essentially approached it as an experiment. Um, you know, in an emerging market, we're essentially reinventing the wheel as far as best practices and, and standards for farming this crop. So we approached it in a very analytical fashion, which was we know that this crop will do certain things, but for instance, moderate soil. What does moderate soil mean? How moderate of a soil will it grow in? What levels of soil amendment work best for it? What kind of pests are we really gonna be looking at? We chose that Western slope of Colorado for two reasons. One, it has extremely um, unfavorable soils. The soils in that area are um, typically expansive clay, very alkaline, high in calcium chloride with low phosphorus and what little phosphorus is available is bound up by the calcium. I can make soil better, but it's very difficult to go and make it worse. So it, we did varying amounts of soil amendment all the way through to truck tin super soils. Um, different types of planting, we did direct seeding, we did transplants at different stages, we did different seeding depths, we did different planting concentrations and field to gather a really good amount of baseline knowledge to inform our, our endeavors moving forward. Um, I am a fifth generation farmer um, I come from a long line of farmers in South Georgia. Uh, our family is in a great bit in pecans and peaches, so we've got some orchard crops. We do some ornamentals for Monrovia. 
but the majority of our uh, fields have been in tobacco and cotton, uh, different types of corn, wheat, um, soybeans, peanuts, those types of things. And then we do some produce. We do melons and uh, tomatoes as well. So I come from kind of that rich farming background. My husband's also a fifth generation farmer. He grew up on a, a large cash crop farm in Iowa, Northern Iowa. Um, and, you know, having a, an extensive relationship in the cannabis industry and experience on the marijuana sides, but also coming from a heavily agricultural background. I saw this as an opportunity to really take um, an emerging market and run with it. So what we're going to go over today, we're going to go over the past, the present, and the future of hemp farming in essence. And if all of you could bear with me, I tend to be a very detail-oriented, granular person. Um, so I get fairly specific. I'm going to try to temper that a little bit today and leave that more for the question and answer. So I'm going to try to move through this fairly quickly. Um, now, from a past, from a regulatory perspective, you know, to begin with, we were working under the 2014 Farm Act, um, which established uh, research programs to determine whether or not we have a viable potential industry here. Um, under the 2014 Farm Act, we were given a little bit of, a, of an alleviation of, of regulation that we were accustomed to under marijuana laws. However, the crop did still remain Schedule One and subject to 280E. Um, but we're grateful that we had this particular prospect or this particular avenue to, to experiment within because it did allow us to prove concept. Um, we're now operating in most states under the 2018 Farm Act. Um, certain states are still operating under the 2014 Farm Act. It's created a little bit of a legal and regulatory quagmire. Um, however, we will be fully under the 2018 Farm Act come October 31st of this year. And that has removed hemp and hemp derivatives from the Controlled Substances Act purview. So it's no longer under DEA control, transferred all the regulatory authority to the USDA. Um, it's no longer Schedule One, no longer subject to 280E. And just a note for those of you who are not familiar with 280E, 280E is a line in the IRS tax code that states that any business that touches a Schedule One substance can only write off their cost of goods sold. What it does effectively is it creates a situation where your effective tax rate is up in the 70% range instead of down between 20 and 30 where most businesses are able to get their effective tax rate. It's, a, it's, a, it's a definitely a barrier um, to entry in these types of markets. Um, and the 2018 Farm Act has also removed a lot of the barriers to interstate commerce and international commerce because now we no longer need DEA export licenses to move these across the border into other countries. And it's alleviating a lot of the concern and damping down some of the issues that we've seen in prohibition states like Idaho and Texas that have shipped, uh, seized shipments of, of legal hemp in the past. Um, from a production perspective, we began with literally a handful of acres in 2016 to nationwide 600,000 licensed acres with 300,000 planted in 2019. Of the 300,000 acres planted in 2019, roughly 120,000 made it to harvest at varying degrees of success. Um, there were a lot of anomalies in the last season. Um, we had some anomalous precipitation across the upper southeast through the Midwest, through the grain belt states that pushed planting dates out, caused a lot of issues with stem rot and root rot in field due to standing water and poor drainage and some of the loamier soils and the, um, and the higher carbon content soils in, in the Midwest and the Upper Southeast. Um, we're seeing some massive market volatility today. That market volatility has been there since the inception of the markets. Um, we're seeing some emergence of new dominant cannabinoids. Currently speaking, most of the focus still for cultivation is on cannabidiol, which is CBD. We're seeing a shift in focus and more interest into cannabigerol genetics for two reasons. One, CBG is the mother molecule in the plant, and that it is the cannabinoid that, that is produced before any other cannabinoid is produced in the plant, and each other cannabinoid is a transmutation of CBG. CBG is signaled within the plant. Um, the plant actually converts it from CBG to the other uh, m um, minor and major cannabinoids. Um, the attraction to CBG from a research perspective is that in lab, we can turn CBG into any other uh, cannabinoid. 
So it does create a lot more of opportunity from a post-production perspective in that you can better time markets and market demand for other minor cannabinoids by essentially converting them from CVG and field. So you still have a hemp derived cannabinoid, but it's exactly the one that you're looking for. Um, what we've seen in the past and we're still experiencing today, I see it in every single new state, we still see it in some of the states that have been online for a year or two, is that this is an extremely steep learning curve situation. This is not an easy crop to grow. It is not an inexpensive crop to grow. And even people with extensive agricultural background who also have a great deal of experience with cannabis genus plants still have trouble farming this crop outdoors at scale. Um, there are a lot of issues that are not even anticipated until they crop up for new farmers. Um, and, and the other thing that we see that's making this a little bit more of a rocky start is that this is the first crop that I have ever seen emerge in the US where we are attracting people with no agricultural background whatsoever wanting to farm this crop. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that there's some excitement surrounding it and it's attracting people who care very deeply about regenerative agriculture and things like that because they're, they're concerned about um, environmental causes, those types of things. We're also attracting a lot of people to the market who do not understand that farming, regardless of crop, will never be a get-rich-quick scheme. It is a long-haul, difficult, arduous task. Some years you're up and some years you're down. It's an inherently, mar inherently volatile and risky business to be in. Um, and there's a, there's a lack of, of comprehensive understanding of that to new market entrants that don't have any experience with um, agriculture. We also see farmers who are coming over from cash crops where most of what they're doing is, is extremely mechanized and requires very little labor who struggle with this crop because they're not anticipating the amount of labor that it's going to require and the amount of post crop handling that has to happen after harvest, but before the crop has been sold. From a market trajectory, just speaking of a commodity perspective, we've seen prices come down, which was anticipated. Um, the market price for the isolated CBD molecule in 2017 was $10,000 per kilo. In 2020, right now, spot buys are going for roughly $1,200 per kilo up to $2,500 per kilo. I've used $1,200 per kilo because that's the lowest that I've personally seen a transaction close at within the last week. Market price for crude oil has also dropped off substantially. Um, we've dropped from $4,000 per kilo in 2017 to roughly two. 750 per kilo in 2020. Um, now, at, simultaneously, we have not seen a corresponding dip in per milligram prices in finished consumer goods and products. So that end is holding steady. Consumer demand is still there. I'll get into in a second kind of part, part of the issues and, and what's holding back the commodity end of the market here. Um, just to touch on CBG as well, to give you an idea of how quickly new cannabinoids as they are discovered can fall off a cliff. CBG is cannabigerol. Market price for that isolated molecule has dropped from 150,000 per kilo in 2017 to 8,500 per kilo last week. Um, another cannabinoid that is getting some attention is CBN. Nine months ago, I personally sold a kilo of CBN for $92,000. Last week, uh, one of my business partners bought a kilo of CBN for 12 grand. So we see a steep drop off as people ramp up production and are able to produce the molecules at a higher rate. We've seen steeper drop off for CBG, CBN, and some of the other minor cannabinoids because we do not have established consumer market demand for those particular cannabinoids. That demand and that knowledge of it in the customer base is roughly where the CBD knowledge was in the consumer markets back in 2016 early to late 2017 range, where we were looking at roughly half a percent of the population was familiar with it or what it might do for them. Um, and as consumer education grows, we anticipate demand to grow as well. Um, we're also moving toward a global market as opposed to only a US market, which changes things dramatically. At present, the market is in an extremely deep trough there's a lot of biomass that is sitting, um, and I'm going to touch on that momentarily here. The issue with the biomass that's sitting is I would say 80% of it is either trash or not commercially viable. Um, 
I've looked at 300 lots over the last four months. I've had farmers call me from Virginia, um, Oklahoma, Colorado, some here in Illinois, um, some of the states, Michigan and Wisconsin, we've gotten calls from those, a few guys out of California, um, Kentucky, uh, North Carolina. What we're seeing is that a lot of farmers, there's a lot of there's a lot of confusion within the farming community of what the quality levels and the metrics have to be in order for them to have a saleable crop. And there's a lack of, there's a lack of suitable communication coming from a lot of the labs and the processors that are buying the crop or looking to buy the crop to farmers to communicate to them exactly what they can and cannot accept. And that's creating problems. I would say half of the hemp that I have seen sitting that's still being marketed as hot and can't legally be sold. So it will never be processed. Um, I'd say half of the remaining is infested with either aspergillus and other mycotoxins that are extremely expensive to remediate and process, um, or they are high in, in um, pesticides that are not allowed to be used on this crop. We've seen a great deal of crops fail pesticide testing. A lot of newer farmers get really, really uh, panicky when they're dealing with pest issues and they will spray things on this crop, not understanding that certain systemics and petroleum based uh, pesticides will show up on our screening tests. So while we do have a great deal stockpiled, the majority of what's there is either non-commercially viable or cannot legally be sold. And the vast majority of it is not being stored properly. So it's continually degrading month after month. Um, we are seeing, again, we, we're seeing consumer demand and per milligram price at retail holding fairly steady month over month. That's really good. The FDA has released some comments that signal a near-term release of guidance. But what we're starting to see now is we're starting to see increased interest and demand from consumer product manufacturers. Um, I currently have three Fortune 500s who we are consulting with um, to help them set up supply chain um, and supply chains for cannabinoids in a manner that will produce consistent quality to spec cannabinoids for their needs. From a growth potential in the market, we have serious infrastructure needs, um, demand for growing, growing for, the demand is growing for uh, hemp-based consumer goods aside from drug type hemp. However, the demand for those is not rapidly expanding. It is definitely growing, but it's not a rapid expansion. There's no spike in demand. Um, we do have uh, some decortication plants going in in the U.S., notably a very large one in Lubbock, Texas. This should spur a rising demand for growth of and farming of fiber crops. Um, what we have available as well, or, or a need for within the infrastructure uh, as well, is uh, increased crushing facilities in the U.S. for seed oil production. Um, and then with those increase, uh, an increase in the number of crushing facilities, we will have an increase in the demand for the growth of grain type uh, crops, which are much easier and more cost effective to grow. Both fiber and grain type are much more cost effective to grow. Um, I see the major potential for this to be biofuel. Hemp has a higher lignocellulosic content than the vast majority of other plants known. Um, to be suitable for lignocellulosic production. Um, the only plant that it exceeds is switchgrass. Switchgrass has an extremely high lignocellulosic content, but there's no money in growing it, so no one will farm it. I really feel like hemp has the potential to sweep the Midwest for biofuel, for biofuel production. Um, the infrastructure is there in the Midwest and farmers need another crop in that area. They are clamoring for something other than corn um, they're starting to see negative impact to the Mississippi watershed from nitrogen runoff from corn farming in the Midwest. Um, it's, it's creating some, some situations and more forward th thinking farmers are seeing kind of the writing on the wall that they cannot continue to just cycle out corn and beans ad infinitum. Um, something's going to have to give. Um, the market is definitely a global market. We're starting to see global demand rising. A lot of export to Europe, especially uh, Western Europe surprisingly. 
There's a great deal of demand in Canada. One of the reasons that we split our farm and some of our farm is in Canada is that the pricing in Canada currently is roughly three times the pricing for uh, comparable product on the US side of the market. Now, just to give you a little bit of background about DVFM, I touched at the very beginning that one of our first and most important things were to figure out exactly where our break-even points are, where are our bottlenecks, what can this plant tolerate, what will it not tolerate, what are the optimal soil types, what's the optimal relative humidity and temperature outdoors, what climates is it just not suitable for, these types of things. Um, just to give you an idea, this is the way that this shows. We've got, I've got three pictures here. Um, this is an Instagram snapshot of one of our direct competitors in the San Luis Valley in Colorado. This is their 2017 crop. This is a marketing photo that they took of their field. These plants are already in flower. They will get not much bigger than they are currently. Moving to the next picture, this is a picture of a field in Oklahoma. This farmer contacted us, had attempted to direct seed his field, had not done a lot of soil testing. He was an experienced farmer, but a cash crop farmer. Really got in over his head, wound up with a lot of weed pressure that was very difficult to beat back and control. Um, the last photo that we see to this side is a picture of our worst field. Now I recognize that the perspective on this is off. I wish I'd had a farther back photograph of the same field, but it's fairly easy to see from the photograph that these plants are significantly larger. They have a lot more flower weight on them and they're much more densely packed in the field. That's the difference between direct seeding. This is a clone that was planted very late into hot soils. This was a direct seeded field. This is about the best direct seeded field I've ever seen. And I'll tell you right now, it would cost more to harvest this field than there is actual viable plant material for processing in it. We had to tell the farmer that they had experienced crop loss. This field went through two flash floods, one creating 36 hours worth of standing water in field two weeks prior to harvest, literally maybe a week um, a week before this photograph was taken. This flash flood was extensive enough that it washed one of our semi trucks up onto its side in the ditch. It was a pretty disastrous, um, pretty disastrous situation, but we still did manage to harvest 30 acres out of 40. We did lose 40 acres to standing water, um, but the 30 acres that we harvested um, we harvested close to 60,000 pounds out of, which is a significantly uh, decent harvest. And the blended biomass out of this particular crop hit 12%. CBD, just under 12%. It was 11.9 and change. Um, while retaining THC levels well below the uh, federal cutoff of total potential at 0.3, it came in at 0.18. Um, this particular market, as you can see from the previous photographs, this is not an easy crop to grow. Even experienced people run into problems and sometimes they don't know what they're looking at. There are significant barriers to entry. I'll touch on the grain and fiber type because they're less first. The grain and fiber type varietals, we do have infrastructure deficiencies. I touched on earlier that we are lacking, um, we are lacking crushing facilities and decortication facilities for seed oil and fiber production for this crop. There is a learning curve to growing it as well. Um, there are a few seeds available for grain and fiber type crops within the US and sourcing those seeds can be very difficult. There is lower demand for these crops within the US at the current time. So you wind up with a bit of a chicken and an egg scenario. If you grow it, who are you gonna sell it to? It's kind of a, a, a bad situation. And there are still a few regulatory hurdles there because in the United States, grain and fiber type crops are monitored to the same level as cannabinoid rich hemp crops, even though there's virtually no possibility of them spiking THC in field because they just don't have the genetic capacity to produce the cannabinoids. On the cannabinoid rich hemp side, um, we have the lack of established best practices. We just illustrated how that plays out in a practical situation. There's literally no price transparency. We lack, um, we lack um, commodity market exchanges. We lack futures markets. We lack really any kind of a platform for trading of the commodities for this particular crop on. 
And the market is overrun by a lot of people who are brokers and they're not really brokers. They've never really brokered anything before. Um, they're just uh, attracted to the market because they feel like they can make a lot of money in a very quick period of time. And that's truly not the case with what they're trying to do. We see a new crop of brokers on nearly a monthly basis, it feels like. Um, we and our company refuse to do business with, with brokers unless they are, are contractually related to the buyer or the seller. The regulatory hurdles that are on the cannabinoid rich hemp side are a little more onerous than the regulatory hurdles on the grain and fiber type because we're being held back by a lack of guidance from the FDA. Um, that is what is holding back the majority of your larger consumer good manufacturers. They are waiting for the FDA guidance before they start actually producing products, which is a smart business plan from their end. Um, there's an extremely high cost of entry with this particular crop. What we have seen is that when we use our best practices so that we get decent yields, um, we are looking at crop input costs that range anywhere from 12 to 18,000 per acre, depending on the farmer and the ground and what it needs. These are hard costs. A lot of that cost is labor. Some of that cost is depreciated equipment. Um, some of that cost is your seeds, which are a very expensive portion of it. Um, there's just a great deal that goes into planting this crop that a lot of people are not familiar with. And it, it is an extremely expensive crop to plant. Currently, best practices are to plant from transplants. So very early, we set on a very small transplant that has an intact tap root that is not um, air pruned. And by putting out that very small plant within days of the last frost date, we are creating a situation where the plant then grows in field as if it germinated there. But these plants do not germinate well in field. They really have to have a perfect storm to germinate um, at a decent rate. And because of the cost of the genetics, it does not make sense to overplant a field um, because it's, it's literally less expensive for me to put the transplants out than it is to lose 60% of my seed upon planting. The future of the markets, um, I believe we're going to see specialization along major agricultural corridors. And that specialization is going to tag into existing infrastructure. I believe that we're going to see a great deal of fiber type hemp grown both in your arid areas and in your more humid areas in your southeast production states because there's a lack of uh, there's less, to, less risk of fungal pressure from that perspective. I don't believe we're going to see a lot of true cannabinoid rich hemp being grown in your southeastern states over time because of the humidity levels there create and the heat creating kind of a perfect storm for dew set toward the end of the fall. They go, you go from uh, fairly hot nights and fairly hot days at higher humidity, which is much easier to contend with, to temperature drops as we enter fall and the plants are really putting on heavy flower, dew set in the morning. That dew set leads to some issues with fungal pressure that we have seen. The existing infrastructure that's available within the Midwest, I believe, will gear the Midwest toward dual purpose varietals that are grown for their lignocellulosic content for biofuel production with cannabinoid rich hemp as a secondary crop. I think moving into those areas as well, we're going to see a lot more dual purpose that's for grain production. So we have cannabinoid as a byproduct, but the primary purpose of growing is grain. The Midwest makes sense for these types of growing or these, these styles of cultivation as well, because in the Midwest, we have the corridors available for getting crops in and out of the field. We've done it with corn for a long time now. We have the railway switches through. Uh, from a logistical per perspective, it makes a lot of sense, but those biofuel facilities that are already sprinkled all over the U.S. are really key. And we've seen there is a, a large biofuel facility that was built outside of Emmitsburg, Iowa, about six years ago, five or six years ago, shut down two years ago. Um, and it was shut down because it was attempting to create lignocellulosic biofuel using corn silage as the feedstock, but the feedstock proved too inconsistent. Hemp is one crop that we can definitely create a consistent feedstock with. Um, uses and demand of the crop in the future, we're seeing some innovation. Some of the interesting and more interesting innovations that I have seen are the usage of hemp plastics. Adidas is actually working a project, a research project in Germany with the University of Heidelberg 
um, to create better hemp plastics for their shoes. We're seeing hemp biochar being graded out and mixtures of larger particulate and smaller particulate being used in experimental air scrubbers in, um, in uh, Barcelona. There are some sitting on the streets in um, Hamburg and places like that. Um, from a global competition perspective, we definitely have some global competition. We do not, however, have a ton of global competition for cannabinoid rich hemp outside of Central and South America. Central and South America will be a large producer of these particular crops, but I do not believe they're going to be as competitive as a lot of people believe they're going to be because in order to run in that environment, we have to run autoflowers and our current autoflower genetics are really um, finicky, to put it mildly. Um, we have the ability in the US to create a powerhouse here with uh, dual purpose and tri-purpose varietals that we're currently working on in our R&D projects. In our R&D projects, I know of several other seed companies that are working on dual and tri-purpose varietals as well. Um, their focuses are a little bit different than mine. They're trying to get to sort of one perfect plant. We are looking at regionally specific cultivars is what we're doing in our, in our plans. Um, areas of investment need in order for this industry to continue to move forward and to stabilize. On the genetic side, we need direct seed options because a great deal of the cost is producing and, and planting transplants. We need dual and tri-purpose crops that can be row cropped more in the style of sorghum or corn. Um, we need to breed in fungal and pathogen resistance. A lot of these plants, most of the cannabinoid rich hemp in the United States was bred underneath prohibition conditions for decades. Our current CBD rich varietals were pulled from old school marijuana strains in the traditional marijuana markets year after year and then within the medical marijuana space. So there's not really been an opportunity for large plots of open pollinated um, plantings um, for selection and breeding of true inbred lines. Instead, what is happening is specific female plants are being chosen for specific qualities. We're creating armies of clones of these specific female plants. So we have very little genetic diversity. And then we are reversing other female plants to create feminized pollen um, and create a feminized seed stock. What that does is it is definitely better from cloning than a clone in field. It's gonna perform better than a clone. You do have the ability to, to have a plant with a tap root. You have a stronger growth pattern within the plant because you've retained the plant's uh, central support system within that ap apical meristem. Um, but, it, it, but at the same time, the genetic diversity is still very limited within the field, meaning that specific types of pressure can take hold and move like wildfire, which is clearly problematic meaning that you really have to have comprehensive integrative pest management protocols in field and fungal management protocols in field because you have to get ahead of this problem rather than responding to it. Um, we need the patented cultivars are definitely on the horizon. Currently, the majority of what's on the market cannot be patented because it's worked off of open source genetics that have been worked again for decades within the medical marijuana sphere. Um, from an infrastructure perspective, we need elevators and co-ops with mobile field drying and stationary drying in order for this, this crop to ever really get off the ground. Um, currently, we do not have access to anything like that. Most farmers are on their own. We're starting to see a few farmers per, set up co-ops. Um, none of them really have anything like an elevator. Mobile field drying will be a game changer. We actually sell a dryer call, uh, from a company called Tarmac. They built our dryer for us custom that we use up in Ontario. Uh, the one we have in Ontario is stationary because it's located right by our fields and it can barely keep up with our 800 acres in Ontario. Um, but it will do about 30 tons of throughput in an hour and it can be made mobile. We can make it a little smaller. It'll do about 20 tons of throughput in an hour but we'll be able to put that from a field to field perspective. And the difference there being that right now, if we move wet material out of the field, we can fit about 7,000 pounds of wet material on a reefer. If you dry that material though, it can be compressed and super sacks. 
and we can do that. We can get a non a non reefer, so your standard semi truck trailer. We can pack that thing nearly full. We can get close to twenty thousand pounds on it. So from a logistical and fuel cost perspective, it is far more advantageous to pull this stuff out of the field and dry it in field. Um, the technology is there. Someone just needs to step up to the plate and start building mobile field drying companies, similar to harvest companies that we have for other other crops. Um, stationary drying in areas where this is being largely grown is necessary as well. Currently, there are very few stationary drying facilities. Most are owned by processors. Oops, we need processing to crude as well. Um, we need more of these processing facilities. There is a way to do in-field extraction to crude. So what we're taking out of the field is uh, in a 55 gallon barrel drum instead of dried material that can degrade or wet material that can rot which is problematic. We need tolling that is certified good manufacturing process. At this point, the FDA has signaled that nothing that, is not, that comes from anything other than a CGMP facility will ever be considered grass. They will not consider it a food assay food additive. Um, that's been made pretty clear over a period of time by multiple comments and, and things coming out of the FDA through their spokespeople. Um, and we need CMEs and futures markets for, tr for price transparency. That's key. Um, I'm involved in one that's being built here um, through the Chicago Board of Trade. Hopefully we can get that up and off the ground with full functionality. Um, unfortunately, to begin with, some of it's gonna have to be one-sided on the platform. There's no really way around it until we establish some, some baseline analytics there. Um, Areas for innovations and ad adaptations. Um, we need harvesting options. There are a few companies working on harvesting options. Um, nothing really seems to be driven toward wet harvest, wet me mechanized harvest of cannabinoid rich hemp though. The majority of the mechanical out there from an, an, a new development perspective for implements and equipment is geared toward grain type and dual purpose or fiber varietals. Um, we have issues with pest and fungal pressure mitigation in field as the majority of the pesticides that would typically be safe for us to use on hemp crops are just not labeled for use on cannabis and hemp as of yet. This is something that each of these companies has to go through in their labeling process to get hemp added as an acceptable crop for use with harvest day intervals, etc. Um, we need some, definitely need areas, there's definitely room for innovation within the fertility spectrum. Here, we do a lot of crop fertility at Delta Valley. Um, it's one of our major areas of uh, consulting is essentially full scale pre-plan, uh, growing plan, harvest plan, post-harvest plan, but we also do the fertility planning as well. So we handle the logistics and, and the groundwork. Weed pressure mitigation, another major, major issue. Um, weed pressure in this crop is extremely heavy. It is very intense um, and it's something you really have to get ahead of. We did not use plasticulture on our farm in Ontario in 2019. Plasticulture is one of the things people frequently use because we were worried about too much rainfall and holding too much water in the field. We were right to be concerned about that, but the flip side of that is that I had to put a crew of 100 experienced agricultural weeders in the field and run them pretty much 24 seven for three months. Our labor costs doing that ate our budget up completely. We blew through our entire contingency fund and had to reinvest. So that was a, a very um, interesting pinch point on larger acreages. We're looking at um, running a couple of test plots for 2020 planted like 1930s cross check corn, where it's planted on a grid without creasing the field and you run your cultivator in two directions. But we also sell an, a piece of equipment made by Ferrari and it is an automatic weeder. It's an automated hoe. It goes through the field and it uses a camera sensor to eradicate anything other than your target crop problem with this particular piece of equipment is we can only use it for about two months into the season before the plants are too large for this particular piece of machinery to work. Um, at that point, in some areas of the country, we're able to, to plant this crop close enough together that it knits together and it crowds out the weeds. But in our more humid areas where fungal pressure is a larger concern, that's something we're still working out. 
Um, our business model, we are by farmers and for farmers. Um, everything that we do is based on, we establish a trust relationship with the farmer. I have a great deal of clients and customers who have come to us after they declined to do business with us in their first year because we gave them a very realistic um, picture of what to expect and they didn't like what they heard. So they went to someone else who gave them something that was a little bit more rose colored than, than what we provided and ran into some problems. Um, we do a lot of vetting. We test everything out on our own fields. We don't sell anything that we don't use. And we don't advise our farmers to do anything we would not do on our own fields. Um, at the end of the day, I believe it is my responsibility to tell my client the brutal truth, even if it means I lose them as a customer. Um, I'm, I'm not in the business of causing people to lose money. That's my, that's my mantra. Um, I tell people the same things I would want to hear, and I want to hear the blunt truth. Um, we've had our seeds, we've had our equipment, we've had our fertility. Um, we test out our pest and fungal pressure mitigation. Everything is extremely heavily vetted. We vet it in multiple markets and multiple environments, multiple soil types, multiple climates to ensure that we are able to give the best advice that we can give to our clients. And at the end of the day, if it is a question that I do not know the answer to, I will either find the answer to that question or I will happily hand that client off to someone who knows the answer to that question who I know they will be in very good hands with. Um, our farming operations in 2017, we had 88 acres owned with an additional 12 under management. Um, we were running it as an experimental farm, eight licenses each divided, analytics pulled from that. The data we pulled from that informed our cultivation practices moving forward. Um, due to what we did in 2017, we were able to expand and scale. And in 2019, we were at 800 acres owned, 197 under management on the US side of the border true production farms with average yields per plant across all just under a thousand acres of roughly 3.2 pounds per plant with an average cannabinoid content of blended biomass at 10.23% CBD and 0.25% total potential THC. So we were compliant in 2019 under the new USDA guidelines. What we have lined up for 2020, um, we're a licensed dealer for Ecogen Seeds. We are bringing in three other seed lines um, with an additional five varietals um, throughout 2020. We'll be testing those seed varietals in multiple markets on test plots um, to determine which ones we will carry for the 2021 year. Um, we currently have 21 million seeds in stock across five varietals, four of those being very well performing CBD rich varietals that are compliant, the other being a CBG varietal. And we are continuing our R&D both in vetting other people's seeds, but continuing to produce and, and work on breeding our own uh, patentable lines that are dual and tri-purpose and geared toward each region of the US. On uh, our equipment and implements, we are a licensed Ferrari dealer um, we sell a great deal of their equipment. We get a lot of, in, a lot of interest on a particularly their transplanter, um, which pays for itself essentially in year one. Um, it's a pretty remarkable piece of equipment. We work with tarmac dryers. Um, we personally utilize their dryers. They are tunnel dryers. I feel like they work better than a lot of the other options on the market from an efficiency perspective. And when we're talking scale, we can't lose sight of efficiency. A lot of people moving into this are so worried about pres preserving every little tenth of a percentage point and every little leaf that might have a little bit of trichome on it. And we're looking at this from a scale perspective. We do not believe in, in stepping over dollars to pick up pennies. Um, and then we're continuing to do our harvest R&D. Currently, we've been using Shelburne headers, modified slightly and pulled instead of pushed to strip our plants in a field. And while it works, it's a bit of a brute force solution. Um, it's not as clean as I'd like to see it, and it's not as efficient as I'd like to see it. So we're still working um, on some things with that. Under the fertility arm, um, we wrap uh, Tidal Vision Kytosan, Humigrow for crop fertility, and Fertile Gold for organic crop fertility. But our R&D focus there is in seed coatings and primers to increase root production or root growth in the plant um, to get, essentially get to field a little faster. Our goal with that, we've seen with our seed coatings, 
we've seen a slight drop off in germination rates, but we've seen a, a much better um, plant going to field. And we see a lot less transplant shock in the field because they have much more developed root systems when they get out there. Plus we're able to get them out about seven days earlier than otherwise because those root balls hold together really well without having to use glue in our soil medium. Um, on the consulting side, we do full scale consulting for every part of the hemp process from choosing your genetics to setting up all of the Gantt sheets to run your farm off of, to determining your harvest methodology, your weed pressure mitigation, your pest, your integrative pest management protocols. We help farmers, we introduce farmers to legitimate labs that have track records and who do give out um, contracts after you prove yourself. So most of, the, most of the labs that we deal with, they will not do a forward contract um, with a first year farmer, they will do a tolling contract with a first year farmer and then move to a forward when that farmer has proven their ability to uh, perform, um, which I think is a reasonable way to approach it from their perspective. But we do everything from phone support all the way to turnkey farm and processing development. We've done this for a couple of outfits already where we started with absolutely nothing, but I want to have a hemp farm. And by the time we were done with it, they had ground, they had fertility plans, they had everything lined up, they had staff lined up, experienced farmers hired, equipment, the whole nine yards ready to go. And then we hold their hand through that first season. We're there in case of emergency break glass through the second season. And then by the third season, they're usually ready for the training wheels to come off a little bit. Um, we're also working some partnerships with um, USDA State Cooperative Extension Commercial um, Agriculture Education Initiatives to create more comprehensive, very granular and specific, much more deep than basics um, educational programs for farmers in the Midwest right now. Um, and I think that that's really key for this. Um, I hope that that was informative and helpful, and I hope that I've gotten through it in a decent period of time. I'm going to open up for questions now. Great. Thank you, Ginger. And I, I would like to let the audience know that you can ask a question um, either by tapping in in the middle of their screen, your screen. There should be a Q&A chat function. Um, I, I'll, I can read questions for that, or if you raise your hand, I can unmute you um, and you can ask your question aloud. Um, but I'd actually, I'd like to start off, kick it off here. Um, given kind of the, the volatile market and kind of steep learning curve that, that you've kind of described, um, what really inspired you to get into hemp so early? So I, I grew up on a farm in South Georgia. My great grandfather founded it. Um, the oldest building on our farm was built in 1897. And I spent a significant portion of my 20s running away from agriculture as hard as I could. But I like plants. And I experienced two things as a teenager that really changed my life trajectory. One was my grandmother was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor at the age in 1995 when I was 15, 16 years old. Um, they gave her a 4% five-year survival rate. The same year I fell 22 feet in a, on a construction project. My dad and I were building a deck off the back of our house. It was built on a ravine for my grandmother. And I slipped off of the deck that we were building and landed 22 feet below flat of my rear end and experienced a compression fracture where I lost an inch and a quarter of height off the anterior side of my 12th and 13th vertebra. I have injury induced scoliosis. Um, those two things really changed the trajectory of my life. When my grandmother was diagnosed, my uncle and I started growing marijuana to help her with the symptoms of the chemotherapy and radiation. Um, we had physicians at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville pull us aside after about four months of her taking the oils that we were creating and telling us that they did not know what we were doing and they didn't want to know what we were doing, but whatever we did, don't stop. My grandmother passed away from complications due to pneumonia at the ripe old age of 97 in February of 2018. I personally am bedridden if I go more than three days without cannabinoid therapies. With them, I can hike 14,000 foot mountain peaks like it's nothing. So this plant's always been near and dear to my heart. And I saw it as a way to bring some excitement back to family farms. 
I can't go back to South Georgia because there's nothing there for me now because those communities are dead. They have died. Um, there's, there's no infrastructure. There's, there's nothing there to build anything off of anymore. But there are a lot of communities that are in the surrounding area, not necessarily the one that I came from. But there are a lot of communities in that surrounding area and throughout the rural and agricultural areas of the United States that still have a fighting chance to be thriving communities once again. And I believe that this crop has the ability to give farmers something that their, our older generation, something that their kids can come home to and be excited about. And it gives them a potential to grow a crop that can play in multiple commodity markets at one time, providing some insulation as well. Um, so that's kind of what really attracted me to it. But, you know, some people ride roller coasters and I do this for a living instead. Great. Thank, thank you for sharing, for sharing that story. Um, what, given, kind of adding on to that, what would be, I guess, some of the, the benefits of, of getting into hemp now as a grower? Right now we have an emerging market, an emerging market that's moving into a specialty market, and then that specialty market will crystallize into a true commodities market. Right now, there is a steep learning curve, but taking that on and learning how to do this is going to be key because we are in a narrowing margin environment. And this is a business. This is not a get rich quick scheme. I believe that it is extremely valuable to develop the skill set and be involved and develop the relationships in the industry early on um, to set yourself up for very good chances of success moving forward from long term viability perspective. This crop is here. It is here to stay. We're going to see it morph and, and mutate over time into something that looks nothing like the industry that we're sitting in now. But there is a lot to be said for being an early market entrance. It gives you the ability to have a higher market share and to grow a little faster and to learn from your neighbor's mistakes as well, and, as, well as learning from your own. When we get to a point where this is fairly well established, it's going to be a difficult crop to get into outside of your typical row cropping would be my, my estimation. The contracts will look like hops contracts based on my experience. It's not unusual for us to have a 99 year hops contract to do consult on some hops farms as well, um, though I don't grow it myself. Um, when you're looking at that kind of environment, then it's a very competitive environment to get those contracts in. I think that being in the market and learning from the outset, and I don't advise that anyone start large. Um, I spend a lot of time talking my clients out of running large, large farms. Um, I, had one, I had a conversation this morning with a gentleman who has 5,000 acres in Arkansas and he wants to put a thousand of it in cannabinoid rich hemp for 2020. And I told him, no, I'd love to help you and I'd love your business, but I'm not gonna help you lose money. And if you try to go to a thousand acres right out of the gate, when what you're running now is corn, soybeans, and wheat, you're going to have a very big problem because you don't have the labor base, you don't have the right equipment. And frankly, you're well behind the eight ball. You should have had your plan in place by the end of November, middle of December of last year in order to be able to pull this off without a hitch. Um, so we do a lot of telling people no. And I do a lot of talking people down from 1500 acres to 50 acres. I do a whole lot of that. Interesting. And, and what are some of the, the, the critical factors to success for some of these people that are early starting into it? First and foremost, efficiency from the outset. Data collection and aggregation is really key. Analytics are key with this. You have to record what works and what doesn't work. I would say staying as far away from anyone who is truly marijuana based as possible would be a very good tip. There are a great deal of consultants and seed sellers in the market who have virtually zero experience with this crop and certainly have never grown it successfully outdoors at scale. Presenting themselves as knowledgeable consultants and that is about the fastest way to go bankrupt is to wind up in bed with someone like that on your crop. Key to it is to start small. Look at it as paying tuition. Your first year you are paying tuition. Your second year, your goal should be to break even. Beyond that, once you've figured out how to do it, then you go out and you pursue a forward contract and you pursue that forward contract with an established lab, an established processor who has a track record, who has not screwed over massive numbers of farmers, 
um, whether intentionally or accidentally. We've seen both happen in this market. Um, and to educate yourself. That educating yourself is key. You have to understand where the risks are so that you may mitigate against them. If you cannot understand where those risks are, you can't mitigate against those risks. And there are too many unknown variables that we cannot address with this crop. So your risk level goes through the roof right out of the gate. Great. Well, Ginger, thank you so much for, for sharing this presentation. I, oh, I think I have a question right here. Okay. Um, Ted Schombaugh asks, is there a market for seed production in the fiber side? Yes and no. There will be a market for seed production in the U.S. because the majority of fiber varietals are geared toward growth in Northern Europe or in Canada. And the majority of the ground where I believe fiber is a good fit in the U.S. is going to be your southeastern states and a lot of the midwestern states, which have a very different climate than what we're looking at in those areas. We will have to select for and breed varietals for the U.S. market. However, that is a little bit farther down the road, I believe, simply due to the fact that we just don't have the fiber demand from a production or processing capacity perspective right now. And fiber crops are not valuable enough to justify exportation for decortication. Uh, Ted added a, a specification that this would be in Illinois. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, definitely, there's definitely a need for it, but there's not gonna be a lot of demand for fiber seeds immediately within the Midwest. I think we're looking at probably 2021 and 2022 are when we're gonna see skyrocketing demand for fiber seeds. Um, so if you've got the ability to start a breeding project now and with an eye toward selection for the US markets with a goal toward AOSCA certified true to type seeds, um, then I think that's a really, really smart play. Um, but I think Illinois will be a different, a difficult market um, to do that in um, because Illinois already has some established fields with cannabinoid rich hemp and you're gonna wind up with some conflict with your neighbors. I would say if you go one state over and do it in Iowa, Iowa's wide open, there's no risk for pollen drift in Iowa whatsoever we're actually looking at doing selection for grain type in Iowa this year if they get off of their, get their regulations out quickly enough for us to plant. Great, well, Ginger, I wanna thank you for, for sharing all of your insights with all of us here today um, and kind of ask, ask two following questions, mm -hmm. which are, what can the audience help you out with here and how can they best find you? Well, um, we have a website at www.deltavalleyfarmmanagement.com. Um, you can give me a call. You can find me on social media. Um, I have a LinkedIn profile. I'm fairly easy to locate there. Our office number is 847-235-2317. Um, we're fairly easy to get a hold of and we try to be as responsive as possible. Um, from a, an assistance perspective, um, grow this industry and grow the good. That's my goal with it. There are a lot of people in this industry who are um, working very diligently to lay some groundwork here and anything done to expand upon that groundwork is really fantastic. Um, and if you're gonna plant some plants and farm this crop, then I highly recommend that you utilize us or someone like us with a track record of real scale experience um, because what that will wind up doing for you is it will save you hundreds of thousands of dollars in wasted expenses for trial and error. Um, but vet the hell out of anybody that you are anticipating potentially working with. Um, we, we frequently refer out as well if, if we get a client. I had a client call in from Alabama the other day. They want to build a farm in Alabama and logistically for us, it didn't work. The size of their field and the location and distance from an airport was not workable for us. But what we're doing for that particular client is we're going to hire an experienced hemp farmer to help them out their first year for them. So we're helping them with staffing essentially is what we're able to do to assist them. Um, reach out if you need anything and um, you know, ignore the panic, but also ignore the hype. 
look at everything from a realistic perspective, take the rose colored glasses off. This is a long term situation. It's a highly volatile emerging market. It's a very exciting field to be in for me because the ups and downs can be a bit exhilarating, but more importantly, every day I get up and I have a new problem to solve. There is no same shit different day in this industry. Um, when you're actually farming it, it's a new problem every time you turn around. And I, I personally love that about it because it keeps me very engaged. Great, Ginger, thank you for joining us. We host these calls every week at 3 p.m. Central. You can register for the AgriFood Conversations webinar series by going to agrifoodconversations.com. A replay of this webinar will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. And if you know others that may want to see this webinar and replay, they will also be able to access it on agrifoodconversations.com. Thank you all.